Hello and welcome back. This is the second part of the multi-part series about aviation fuel contamination. In this part, we're gonna talk about particulate contamination. Particulate is the second most common form of contamination and you will very likely see it during your time. These are gonna be bits of solid material that come in a lot of different sizes from chunks of plastic or metal or rubber um, down to very small particles that are measured in microns. And where you detect them in the fuel system can be a good indication of what it is and where it comes from. Now at this point, it's good to kind of separate into two different sets. You have solids and you have particulates. The solids are going to be the larger particles that are easily detectable by the human eye. The particulates are gonna be the very small pieces that are much harder to detect. And when, when we think of really small objects, we tend to think of something like a grain of sand. Well, a grain of sand, even a very fine uh, sand particle, can be as small as 60 microns. But some of the particles that we're talking about here are as small as one micron, which is one one thousandth of a millimeter. Now, both the solids and the particulates can come from similar sources, and they both uh, present similar threats. So what's the vector? Where does this stuff come from? Well, there is a long, long list of potential sources for particulate contamination, both inside and outside the system. And again, at every stage along the fuel's lifespan is a new opportunity for the fuel to become contaminated. Even from the very beginning at the refinery, there may be some remnants of the production process, such as catalyst fines or sulfur compounds or salts that get left in the mix. Then, as the fuel moves throughout its life, the vast majority of the infrastructure that the fuel moves through is going to be made out of steel in one form or another. The most common form of contamination is water. So what happens when water and steel mix? You get rust. And whether you measure in time or distance, the fuel has a lot of exposure to potential rust spots. And rust can manifest in either solid or fine particulate contamination. Once the fuel moves into a tank, whether it's at the refinery, a terminal, or even at the airport, tanks are vented. And just like with water contamination, anything that's carried in the air is gonna access the tank via the vents. And so this is gonna be your dust, pollen, sand, or dirt particles. Have you ever had a construction site at or near your FBO? All that dirt that gets kicked up, it's all gonna go right into the tank. Uh, floating roof tanks are notorious for allowing contamination to slip past their seams, which is why floating roof tanks are pretty rare these days. The filters that are specifically designed to remove particles, well, sometimes they can break down themselves. There might be fibers or SAP from monitors that uh, migrate uh, their way downstream. Some of the filter media from coalescer separators can actually start to shed. I have personally picked up bits of clay out of a line strainer. Now obviously that came from a clay treater that was upstream from the airport, probably at the terminal. So sometimes even the filters can cause problems of their, of their own. Gaskets can break down, hoses can break down, pumps and meters can break down. Um, if you are installing a new hose or a new nozzle, you're probably gonna be using some sort of thread sealant, whether it's Teflon tape, which is not recommended for this exact reason, or some sort of pipe dope. Any excess of that thread sealant can actually separate and make its way into the fuel stream and uh, cause a problem. Sometimes when hoses are manufactured, the release compound that's used to pull them off of their form doesn't get completely washed out. Sometimes the plasticizer compounds that are in the rubber can separate and migrate into the fuel stream. And so the filters, when they're doing their job, they can only filter out particles down to a certain size, somewhere between one and 10 microns, even though there's a lot of variation based on the conditions and there is no specific micron rating for coalescer separators. So what's the threat? Why is this stuff bad? Well, solid particles and even fine particulate, they can clog up filters, they can clog um, pipes, they can clog up engine controls on the aircraft, um, they can start to damage other components. And you know, when the fuel comes out of the single point nozzle, it could be at 50 PSI. It's a fire hose. And just the fluid pressure alone can damage components. We really don't need to be adding in small little particles which become little razor blades at that velocity. They can start to shred um, fuel bladders inside the aircraft. They can knock off uh, tank sensors and probes. Uh, they can do a lot of damage. If there's dirt particles, that dirt is probably gonna carry some organic compounds which could eventually lead to microbial contamination if the conditions are right. And then microbial contamination can start to produce its own solid contamination which just perpetuates the whole cycle. 
So when it comes to detection, where in the system are we going to go to look for it, at what frequencies, and using what methods? This is a linear diagram of a very generic fuel system. There may be some details omitted and your system may look a little bit different, but this is a generic representation of where the fuel goes when it's at the airport. Starting with the fuel farm, we're gonna look for contamination at the line strainer, at the filter sump, at the tank sump. If you have separate filters for inbound versus outbound, there would be another filter sump at the millipore connection and then at the nozzle screen at the loading rack. And then the fuel makes its way into the truck very similar setup. It's gonna be the tank sump, the filter sump, the outbound millipore connection, and then the three nozzle screens. So those are all the sites where we're gonna go actively looking for particulate contamination. As far as frequencies, every single day, we're gonna be looking for um, contamination here, and here, and here, and here. Again, if you have an additional filter, we're gonna be checking that filter sump also. And that's where we're gonna be doing active detection. There's also some passive detection in the form of the DP gauges on top of the, the filter vessels. Now there's a lot of nuance when it comes to reading DP and what goes into it, and DP does not only indicate particulate, but if you have heavy particulate contamination, DP is one of the places where it's gonna show up. As far as monthly, we're gonna be checking the outbound millibore connections and we're gonna be checking all of the nozzle screens every month. And again, this is gonna be looking for fine particulate matter at the millipore and looking for big uh, solid, solid material in the nozzle screens. So that's every month. Every year, according to ATA 103-2587, if your fuel farm has a line strainer, that line strainer needs to be checked and cleaned every year. When it comes to detection methods, we do visual white bucket checks on the sumps every single day. Every month for the nozzle screens, that involves draining off a little bit of fuel and taking the nozzles apart in order to inspect those screens. But the screens and the sumps are looking for those large pieces of solid matter. For the finer particles that you can't see with your eye, that's where the millipore test comes in once a month. And the pore size on a millipore membrane pad is 0.8 microns. That's less than one one thousandth of a millimeter. That's a little bit smaller than what's typically expected to be caught by normal filtration. So the millipore pad is gonna pick up slightly smaller particles, and it's also gonna pick up much larger particles just in case the filter's not doing its job. And you do the, the millipore test downstream of the filter to test the efficacy of the filter itself to make sure it's doing its job. You can also do an upstream millipore test and do a comparison of before the filter versus after the filter, but it's the one that downstream is the one that counts. So what are the parameters? Is there an acceptable limit? Yes and no. For solids, no. Solids are never acceptable. If you see solids anywhere in the system, you need to take action. If you see solid contamination in a sump sample, you need to continue taking samples until you get good clean fuel. With the fuel trucks, if you don't get good clean fuel after three samples, you have to take that truck out of service and investigate. If you get solid contamination in nozzle screens, you need to investigate upstream to see where it came from. Maybe instead of doing it once a month, you should do it once a week until you narrow it down to see where that came from. So solids are never acceptable. But with the fine particulate, it's really not very straightforward. The ASTM does not specify a failure point for particulate contamination. Now, when we get to ATA 103, that says that a millipore rating of a three dry or higher is considered to be unacceptable. But even then, that's not final. The millipore test is qualitative, it's not quantitative, and it's open to interpretation. And the most important part about doing a millipore test is understanding that it's about tracking trends and searching for differences in those trends as opposed to any single test result. So how do we fight it and what do we do if it exceeds the limit? Well, there are some design features that help do some of the work for us, the most obvious of which is filtration. Filters and nozzle screens are there to capture any of that solid particulate if it exists. Um, inside storage tanks, they may also have floating suctions, not floating roofs, but floating suction to help ensure that they're pulling fuel not from the bottom of the tank where contamination is most likely to be. 
Now tanks and infrastructure should have good linings that are intact to keep things from flaking off and moving their way downstream. Some of the work that you do can be supplemented by proper technique. Factor in settling time when you're doing those tank sumps. Filter sumps need to be done under pressure. And when you're checking those nozzle screens, understand the flow patterns because when the pump is turned on, it's pushing fuel and any of that contaminant downstream into that strainer or into that uh, nozzle screen. When you turn the pump off, and if you hold that nozzle vertical, any contamination that's in that screen can fall out of that uh, screen and make its way back down into the hose. Then you take the nozzle apart, you look at the screen, it looks perfectly fine and clean, but that doesn't mean you removed any contamination that may have been there just because of your poor technique. So understand the flow pattern and use proper technique when you do those single point takedowns. Change your filters on schedule and pay attention to anything that changes in your system. With storage tanks, especially underground tanks, it's not exactly a surprise to see some particulate contamination out of the tank sumps. But when it comes to the filter sumps, especially if you have coalescers, you should be very, very concerned if you ever see particulate contamination in the filter sump. You see, coalescers flow from inside to out, and the filter sump is outside or after that filter element. So if you see solid particles in that filter sump, there's a potential that particulate contamination is going all the way through your filter and is not being stopped. That's very alarming. It could also mean that the lining of the filter vessel itself is starting to break down and you're starting to see chips from that. Another source could also be the drain pipe of that sump. Uh, sometimes build and modifications don't exactly follow the design specifications and sometimes those drain pipes are not made out of what they're supposed to be made out of. If they're made out of black iron or something like that, that eventually is going to rust and start producing particles of its own. So the sump drain pipe should always be made out of stainless aluminum or some sort of epoxy lined carbon steel. So if you're seeing solid particles out of a filter sump, it could either mean that you have a catastrophic failure of your filter element or you're seeing signs of something else and you're not actually seeing the condition of the fuel. Another possibility is poor technique during the annual filter change, and maybe that filter wasn't entirely cleaned and the sump wasn't cleaned very well during that annual change out, or the way that the elements were removed. Um, any contamination that was in that filter element may have washed right back into the filter. Um, so there's technique that in, that's involved when you do the annual change out that can also lead to solid contamination coming out of a filter sump. So what happens if you get a failing grade on a millipore test? Have you ever seen one like this? Or what about like this? The logic behind the millipore test is that the fuel you receive is gonna follow a familiar pattern. It probably comes from the same refinery, the same pipeline, same terminal, same transporter, etc. If there's a change in any of those variables, it will show in one way or another. If the terminal changes some equipment or doesn't follow procedure on certain things, it'll show. If the crude source at the very beginning is different, it'll show. The color of the fuel may be different. The shade on the millipore test may be different. Because this test is about detecting changes, it is vitally important that you do not provide any of those changes, and that comes, comes down to your technique. You need to be testing at regular intervals, under the same conditions, drawing the same amount of fuel. There's some variety in the industry as far as how much fuel to draw during the test. Some people do one gallon, some three gallons, some a half gallon, some might do another number. I personally draw one gallon because that's what it says in the ASTM, which is the most OG of procedures. But whatever number you choose, you have to stick with it in order to maintain consistency of your testing conditions. If you change this number, you need to document that decision and keep that document with your QC records. If you ever get inspected or audited, any inspector worth their weight will want to know about your sampling technique. If they see a change, they're gonna to wanna to know about it. Present them with that internal memo stating, previously we conducted the test this way, moving forward we do it this way. The A, B, and G scales are the colors that you'll most likely see. You won't see blue or green or anything like that. The color of the membrane and the particle contamination is indicative of the fuel's chemical makeup. And just like with wine, the type of soil it comes from and what's in the soil is gonna leave a different chemical fingerprint. The A scale indicates red iron oxide, the B scale indicates oxidation or silica, and the G scale indicates black iron oxide or black sulfides from refinery processes. 
The simple logic is that the darker or more intense the color, the more contaminated the fuel. So the less color, the better. Ideally, you want to see a zero. But remember, the ASTM doesn't specify a failure point. The 103 says that the pad can't be higher than a two when it's dry or a three when it's wet. What do you do when you get a three or a six or a nine? Just like with any other test in QC, you do it again. But the retest protocol is slightly different. When you do the retest, you reload two membranes into the plastic monitor, run the test again under the same conditions, then compare the color of those two membranes that ran together. If they are similar in color within two ratings of each other, it's considered to be acceptable. Well, then what's causing the color if it's not the contamination that we're looking for? That would be color bodies, which are what they call organic staining materials, also called fuel-soluble dye-like components. You can also perform an upstream and downstream test to compare. Previous revisions of 103 required this and required them to be done simultaneously, but this requirement changed with 2019.1, only requiring the downstream testing. Another protocol is to send a sample of the fuel to a laboratory to perform the 5452 test, which is the lab's version of the millipore test. The conditions are slightly different, but instead of comparing the color of the membrane, the membrane is weighed before and after to determine the amount of contamination. This is called gravimetric versus the colorimetric method that we use in the field. And if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, the 5452 gravimetric lab method still doesn't have a fail point, but some aircraft operators or airlines may define their own acceptable limits, which might be around 0.5 milligrams per liter. The bottom line is, if the fuel is in question, you should be communicating with your fuel supplier and possibly the aircraft operators downstream from you. So that's it for particulate contamination. I hope this has been informative and maybe shed some light on some things you didn't know on this topic. Again, this is just one part in a series about contamination. There's gonna be more coming. I hope you stay tuned for that. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. You can either leave a comment or you can reach me on LinkedIn or you can go to my website, maxqfuel.com. Uh, thank you again for your time. Be safe, be smart. And it's always okay to stop and ask questions.